Hello, everybody. It is now 6.14 um, here in Finland on um, the sixth day of August 2014. And I'm beginning a new uh, series with Sagittarius rising and the moon in Sagittarius rising. So I trust it will be somewhat of a philosophical nature. The rising sign tells us the degree... Uh, Let's see, come to that, and I believe it's um, the Pyramids and the Sphinx. It deals with the deep uh, mysteries of nature. And then when we go to the moon, we have an Easter sunrise service, very promising. And we go to the sun, and it is a street, <laughs> a street pageant. Okay, let's see what Mercury gives us. An evening lawn party and Jupiter. Rock formations at the edge of a precipice. I suppose, uh, speaking of the history of the Earth, uh, Uranus is in the uh, third house. I trust we will be able to give some different points of view. And we have um, the, the zero degrees of Scorpio on the midheaven. I hope we can go deep. And uh, it is a confrontation, I think, with, uh, with Jupiter. Jupiter at the vertex. And Vesta, the planet of commitment on the midheaven in Scorpio. A house raising. Well, I hope it's a temple raising. And um, let's see. With Mars, deep sea divers, let us go deep in this matter. And Saturn is now direct. A woman, the father of her own child. It seems to blend the uh, Holy Family in an unusual way. And what's this all about, friends? Well, uh, I'm beginning with the second part of the Rays and the Initiations. I think the part that is read most frequently um, has to do with the 14 rules, maybe the first 300 and something pages. And we uh, had a, a group, um, a 28 Rules group with Stefan Dobayesh, uh, and we worked at that for seven years, starting in 2002, and gave, I think, uh, quite a few people the opportunity to study those rules in depth. And meanwhile, while they were going on, I wrote commentaries on them. Those commentaries are now available at Makara, uh, www.makara.com. U.S. What I would, of course, love to do is to be able to have a chance to speak uh, conversationally about those rules, even as we are right now studying the rules uh, in the Moria Federation uh, faculty. Um, and we have, I think, some very good conversations about them. But I would like to be able to offer some sort of uh, conversational approach to the study of the 14 rules in depth. However, since I've already done part of that work, since I have already written over a seven-year period, a rather uh, extensive, maybe exhaustive, but certainly not, uh, well, it's exhaust exhaustive, exhausting for me, but certainly not in the kind of depth that the Tibetan's material deserves, but as deep as I could go. Since I've already done that, I have to concentrate on the things that I have not done. And the latter part of the book, The Rays and the Initiations, is such uh, an effort, uh, such a task, that I have not yet addressed myself to. I think, of course, some previous reading of the 14 rules and uh, work within the, uh, those rules is important for an understanding of the latter part of the book. Um, all in all, um, if I look at what has been completed thus far, uh, the, the book Esoteric Astrology has been uh, commented on uh, in a thorough manner, line by line. Uh, the latter part of A Treatise on Cosmic Fire, let us say the last hundred pages or so, has also been treated, and this includes the uh, very difficult to interpret stanzas of Zian, which he... Uh, offers, um, 
and which I have um, only completed in verbal form. Uh, a treatise on cosmic fire has commentary going up, written commentary going up, up to the last hundred pages. I've done quite a bit of work on the old commentary, the techniques of integration, the Blessed One, the techniques of fusion, the laws of repulse, uh, and uh, the stanzas for the angel of the presence. So a fair amount of work has been done in Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2. I, I have intentions to deal with some old commentary work in Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1, where he introduces the rays for the first time uh, in terms of the old commentary and the um, the Ray Lords speak to each other in very uh, uh, revealing, uh, very revealing ways. Also, I've just finished um, some work on the Egoic Lotus. I call it the Egoic Lotus uh, webinar book, <laughs> video book. Um, and there are 71 programs there and about 175, 176 hours of programming. And there I have uh, traced uh, the evolution of the human being and made many correlations with uh, uh, factors that we are familiar with in the teaching. I've made those correlations with the uh, development um, and unfoldment of the egoic lotus. So I think there'll be something there for you. Now, you know, it is my hope that I'll be able to do more work in esoteric psychology along this line, and maybe a treatise on white magic along this line, um, whether or not uh, work in esoteric healing will be done, uh, that remains to be seen. I think there are those who maybe, I, I think, know that book better than I do, but uh, the, the more I get into it, uh, the more insights uh, seem to occur. But that will not be an immediate uh, priority. Uh, so, uh, basically, what I'm attempting to do is take a look at the Tibetans' work. It's massive. It's uh, It has to be assimilated as well as we can before the year 2025 because uh, during that year he has said, uh, from that time on and that time forth, from 2025 and after 2025, he will be uh, offering his third installment of the teaching. But it is dependent. I mean, when that comes out, is dependent upon how well we've done in assimilating the teaching that we've already uh, been given. And so, you know, as I look at myself and others in this esoteric field, I realize that the degree of assimilation could certainly be better than it is. And I'm, I'm trying to contribute to that. Um, I don't want to get in the way between the reader and the Tibetan. The best thing you can do, of course, is to read the Tibetan by yourself and ponder deeply on it and see what occurs uh, to you as a result of your reading, to see what intuitions are may be stimulated, and what uh, illumination may come. But I'd like to offer uh, some seed thoughts, some perspectives, some ways of understanding things uh, that maybe the reader will not have thought of before and which maybe the reader will find useful. That's what I'm uh, hoping to do. Um, and I don't, absolutely do not claim to understand everything that's in these books. All I can do is give you my take on certain things that are said. Oh, yes, and, uh, you know, it is my hope as well uh, somehow to uh, work in the book Discipleship in the New Age. My colleague, uh, Eleanor Dramcini, uh, and I did some written work on that, and uh, that was uh, some years ago, and some of those uh, analyses of the... Um, of the various disciples are found on Makara, and Elena has continued that. Uh, she's a very fine rectifier of charts, and she's gone on to try to rectify some of the charts uh, that we, for which we do not really have an accurate birth time, or if we have one, it's very rounded off. But I would like to be able to do some work um, in the beginning and end of Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, and maybe in Dino One. Now, you know, again, I have done written work in these um, in these areas. Uh, th those discipleship in the New Age commentaries, uh, such as I have done, uh, should be um, on Makara. 
the beginning of the book and the end of the book. I think those are pretty complete. Uh, but there's something about the conversational style of uh, discussing and how uh, different ideas may come to one that uh, did not, perhaps, in this more rigorous, laborious uh, itemization of thoughts. Of course, maybe there's more accuracy in the written uh, work, but sometimes more fertility of ideas in the spontaneous uh, expression of thoughts that come when you read these books. Then, of course, there's uh, Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, and there again, I've done a lot of work in the early part of the book before D.K. continues with the teaching uh, of his disciples, uh, their, his personal letters to them. You know, I, I, I don't think it's possible to get all that done. And again, I've done that written work, but there's a lot that might be uh, useful to talk about, you know. And I realize this is like some kind of gigantic study group. <laughs> Uh, a real study group would have you on the webinar and we would discuss and so forth but uh, and that's very good and some people are uh, handling things that way what I would just like to provide for you however is a fairly uninterrupted flow of my ideas uh, or the ideas that come to me or really the thoughts ideas thoughts that come to me and then you know perhaps you can use them in your own study groups I, I realize that what we have here is maybe a different mode of operating. Um, some people are used to the written word and they study together from the written word and so forth. This is a different method. And, uh, you know, it may seem a little less organized, but it is very faithful to the text. And it just simply goes through, you know, uh, paragraph by paragraph, line by line, almost word by word, uh, writing uh, different things down as I go, and sometimes simply talking about them. And maybe some will find this mode of working uh, congenial. That that would be uh, my hope. Uh, because uh, above all, what I want to do is stimulate an interest in the Tibetan's master, Tibetan master's books and the will to enter them in a, a very deep way. And the um, uh, forward progress in the task of assimilating what the Tibetan has said and correlating uh, what he has said in various of his books and applying, of course, in the service to which you are called that which you have learned from the Tibetan. Uh, there's so much to learn from the Tibetan. Um, and obviously, you know, he has talked about the people whose mind ranges all over the planet and they don't really settle down to one particular area in which they can work. I don't know whether that uh, accusation can be leveled at me or not. Maybe it can. But I try to stick to a few books that I think I know fairly well, or at least I have ideas about them, which may be useful to people, and then offer those ideas for their own use, uh, and they can apply uh, what they may learn from me, and certainly what they learn from the Tibetan in their own way. That's, that's the key. We are all self-taught. You know, we, we take what various teachers say, we try to assimilate it, but it's our own thoughts in relation to their thoughts, and, and our own thoughts in relation to our own experiences, which are really ultimately of importance. So, you know, having just finished this uh, Egoic Lotus book and done some work uh, on the adventures and identification, I, I do those periodically, you know. Uh, it's interesting, it's kind of like a, a cycle. I don't know when it will occur, but I, I get deeply into knowledge for a while, and then I say, wait, 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 it's time now again to work um, on identification, on identicalizing uh, identity and finding it everywhere. And so periodically I, I do that, and I've just you know, created three programs. Uh, what I'm working on now is meditations on identification, and I think I can do those uh, now and then and add to people's penetration into the great mystery of being. Certainly for me it is a mystery, and uh, as uh, layer after layer uh, of the veils uh, uh, dissolve or are lifted, I'm always amazed at what there is there and how much more 
still has to be lifted before the true light shines. Okay, so this is our um, this is our chart for beginning, and I noticed that Uranus is uh, conjunct um, the part of fortune in the third house of mind. So this is uh, promising. It's exactly conjunct, although it is retrograde, and and I have Venus exactly on my ascendant at this moment. So, you know, that might say something that that some soul perspective will come forth. And uh, a Jupiter in the sign of the will to illumine, which is Leo, uh, telling us what will happen at the vertex and um, what we cannot avoid. And Mercury right there as well. So there's a... It's kind of interesting. It's... Um, very much like the chart of the University of the Seven Rays itself, which I think um, had uh, about 22 degrees uh, of Sagittarius rising and a number of planets uh, in the eighth house of psychology and occultism. So um, I'm thinking also that there's uh, three mounds of knowledge on a philosopher's head. Uh, interesting, that is where we find Ceres, almost at the end of the uh, sign Libra, and it will be to cultivate philosophy, I believe. Ceres is the cultivator and kind of a harvester, and uh, we have a very sort of Ray 3, um, a very, very sort of Ray 3 symbol there, and then come all these uh, Scorpio planets. I think, you know... Um, I ho Sagittarius is very one-pointed and uh, quite a non-deflectable sign. I don't know how long this will take me. This is, you know, probably 400 pages long. And the astrology book took me a long time. I think it took, uh, you know, somehow two years, maybe even three years, because it's not possible to work except uh, intermittently, you know, sometimes intensively and then for months not possible. So uh, we'll see. And... Uh, how this goes, and let us think together as we uh, read through the second part of the rays and the initiations. That's all we can do is to think in a hopefully illuminated manner with some touching of the intuition. We'll think through together uh, what the Tibetan has offered, and it goes very, very deep, just as the rays do. You know, we, uh, w the, the rules, we, we see some of those rules, which unless you're an initiate of the fourth degree or even fifth degree, you cannot understand in any reality. There may be something that you say, okay, well, I can theorize about this, and indeed you can. But those rules are the rules for group work during the Aquarian age, and they do apply to the ashram. And they don't just apply to groups of well-meaning students who are trying to understand them, although that is important, their, their approach. They are very, very deep. So we're dealing with the fifth... Um, Fifth volume of the Raised Initiations, you know, Esoteric Psychology 1 and 2, Esoteric Astrology, Esoteric Healing, and finally the fifth volume, the Raised and the Initiations, which, uh, again, uh, being his last book, interestingly, it returns to the theme of initiation, and in his first book, he began there with initiation, uh, human and solar. It's a, uh, it's a subject of great interest. It inspires people. It... Uh, promotes their aspiration. It does all those good things to make a true aspirant out of an individual. Remember, all, all true aspirants have taken the first uh, initiation, the birth of the Christ in the heart. And until we are a third degree initiate, we are considered to be uh, an aspirant. And Master DK's purpose is to train aspirants for initiation. At first, the first two initiations, and then later he discussed even the third as a possibility uh, uh, for his uh, training. All right. Uh, well, that's been just a little bit of an introduction. I'd like to. Uh, whoa! This is uh, this is me trying to find out exactly what time to begin, and indeed I did. <laughs> I began as I said I would. And let's see. This is part two of the raise initiations. Well, I will use my usual method, which is to kind of use a red bracket. And when I want to write something, I won't always write something, but when I want to write something, I will uh, put it in the red bracket so you can 
uh, you know, distinguish easily uh, what it is that Tibetan has written and, um, well, you'll be able to tell right away <laughs> and what my commentary on these matters might be. So he's beginning with some introductory remarks. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, we now come to the final part of a treatise on the seven rays, and I have in mind three things which it appears to me necessary to do. And remember this treatise uh, written uh, on the second ray. As a matter of fact, let's make sure that I have my word substitution program going properly. Somehow it wound up with UK English. Um, written on the second ray, whereas the treatise on cosmic fire is written on the first and third rays. So I have in mind three things which it appears to me necessary to do. These three will make this treatise not only the textbook of the new psychology, and that's all the five, really, even healing and astrology, they must be included, but also a more vital factor in human consciousness, because the fact of initiation will be emphasized. I know Master Moria doesn't like too much the uh, term initiation, at least that's how it came through in the Agni Yoga books, but I think the way a DK explains the very rational and clear way that he explains the meaning of initiation, I think would be acceptable uh, to Master M. All right, so these three are, and let us see what they are, the three things he wants to do, emphasize. I propose to deal with the theme of initiation in order to prepare the world of men for the restoration of the mysteries, and these uh, are the mysteries of initiation. Uh, this is okay, uh-huh. You, I have to make sure, this U.S. English thing. Aha, uh -huh, I, I understand what's happened now, okay. Right, I have to have my bracket in U.K. English, all right. These are the mysteries of initiation. So uh, they will be very prominent in the forthcoming age, and the Christ himself will be the initiator uh, in public or semi-public uh, ceremonies, for the first and second initiations. And uh, three great groups, uh, the Masonic organism, the church organism, and the banded esoteric organisms, respectively on rays one, two, three, will offer their candidates for initiations. So will the new esoteric schools, which will be related, I think, mostly to the banded esoteric organisms. I will give some definite teaching on the centers from the planetary angle and also from the angle of the individual aspirant. He's done this, of course, uh, much in uh, esoteric uh, healing, maybe even more exhaustively, but here he talks about the centers in relation to initiation. I will endeavor to relate the seven ray energies to the five and the seven initiations. Uh, okay, um, the five that bring us up to mastership and the seven that bring us up to being a Chohan of the seventh degree, uh, where the Christ and the Buddha now stand, at least uh, in the process of that initiation, and to the three and the seven centers in a new and more arresting manner. So again, wherever there's a seven, always look for ten. <laughs> ten, when you find a seven. The Kabbalah suggests that, you know, with the principal triad, uh, uh, Kether, Chokhmah, and um, Bina, above the seven uh, other Sephiroth. So uh, there's so many um, threes and sevens. And, um, ba -ba -ba. yeah, well, each one of the um, initiations has particular a particular ray associated, most associated with it. Now, in the uh, Egoic Lotus video book, I talked about all the rays in relation to the uh, process of initiation, especially the first, second, and third initiation related to the sacrifice petals. So anyway, just uh, reviewing this, uh, uh, deal with the theme of initiation, right? Uh, teaching on, definite teaching on the centers from the planetary angle and from the angle of the uh, individual aspirant, and relate the seven rays to the five and to the seven initiations and to the three and seven centers in a still more, you know, a, a resting manner. He's already, even before this time, this is the last book, remember, given us so much material, most of which remains uh, 
for us uh, uncorrelated uh, in any significant manner. So that's what some of the hope for these correlational studies is. This is a large order and one not easy to fulfill because so much has already been given out anent initiation. The subject is dangerously familiar, meaning when we've heard it a thousand times, we just don't pay any attention anymore and we stop penetrating. So uh, we must uh, continue to penetrate for depth of meaning, even if terms are familiar. That's obvious, but... It's all too easy uh, to forget. You know, people don't take things in and they say, oh, I've heard it a thousand times, and then that's their excuse for not even trying to take things in. So we have to catch ourselves if we develop a glib familiarity with certain terms, the meaning of which we really don't understand. Okay, by that I mean that certain preconceived ideas are already present in men's minds. And many of these are not factual in nature and need to be discarded or at best reinterpret it. So it's going to be hard sometimes to give up our pet theories and our under, apparent understanding of the initiation process because we may have derived uh, a lot of comfort from it. Uh, but in, you know, comfort, one of the heads of the hydra, we've got to get rid of it. I have myself dealt in a broad and general way with the subject of initiation in one of my earliest books, along with Letters on Occult Meditation, right? Initiation, Human and Solar also yeah, solar. Also scattered through all my writings over the years is a mass of information which needs collating and bringing together as a basis for instruction of disciples in training for initiation. And so we've done this to a certain extent, and the esoteric healing uh, classes have done this, and we have uh, compilations on all the centers, and I would advise you, you know, to... Uh, Go to our Moria uh, Federation's affiliate uh, Ageless Wisdom compilations and see what you can find there that may be of value. That's another thing I would like to do. I would like to take certain of these compilations which offer us the opportunity for topical study and really pay attention to these particular references which uh, target one particular subject and see if we cannot increase the light in that way. In Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, I gave out much more upon this subject and also information of a deeply esoteric nature uh, anent the ashrams of the Masters. So whoever really wants to study the ashrams of the Masters, what we have to do is certainly study Dino 1. And he told us, interestingly, that we are to use a Discipleship in the New Age to attract others into the ashrams. It, it's one of the major purposes of that book. The second volume of the book also contains much that is new and should serve to bring the whole subject much closer to public understanding. It's not an easy book, uh, Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 2, but it is um, deeply useful. So, uh, well, you know, it contains so much teaching. I, even though T DK is going to give out the new teaching, I just uh, cannot see how what he has given so far, also in The Secret Doctrine, can be abrogated. It really has to be studied, and it will place more demands upon the students of the future than um, <laughs> than they may realize. Okay, in the new in, in the instructions now to be given, however, I shall endeavor to cover the ground not already considered, and look at the subject of initiation from the angle of the seven rays. All right, from the effect upon the centers, planetary and individual and from the point of view of esoteric training of the accepted aspirant or disciple. It really amounts to the same thing. We, the accepted disciple is an aspirant. So uh, here it, it's going to get much more technical. These instructions were begun in March 1946. It's interesting that this was a, a time when the um, work of the... Hmm, uh, of the new seed group of 24 was being discontinued. Um, I guess DK, DK had had uh, certain writings uh, he had to prepare through A B, and um, her health uh, was in question, and 30 years of work 
were planned. So, you know, he had to uh, discontinue some of the work he was doing, uh, writing letters to the various uh, remaining students uh, out of the twenty group of 24. And uh, maybe there were not so many by this time, but he did, you know, um, write for them in a very uh, broad way, taking into consideration the needs for the remainder of their life. And basically he said, look, uh, I've given you enough for the rest of your life. Just review the material and uh, study what I've given you in these last letters. And you will see um, that I've, you know, basically I've taken care of you uh, for the rest of your life. But then um, when I think about all of this work that had to be done, between for three years. Now, Alice Bailey died in uh, December of 1949, so this was the three and a half years before her passing. It must have been very uh, intensive. And so uh, we have to realize the, uh, the urgent uh, way in which he was writing for the future. The final volume of a treatise on the seven rays will eventually change the attitude of men's minds towards the mysteries, and towards the activity of spiritual transference, which is one of the names given by the masters to the basic uh, mystery of initiation. Transference to what? Well, you know, in a way uh, from focus within the dense physical vehicle of the planetary logos and even solar logos into the etheric vehicle of the solar logos, that is the cosmic ethers. So uh, the discussion of initiation has been given all the way through uh, the writings, but the, the strongest focus was in the very first book, Initiation Human Solar, and now in this one and in great depth. And uh, I might say that some of DK's writings are written really for initiates. He certainly said this was true, and by that we mean initiates of the third degree. He certainly said it was true of his uh, uh, work in the Treatise on Cosmic Fire. And now we come, uh, well, well, you know, when you look at the r rules for initiations for disciples and initiates, you realize that so many of them are written for the initiate understanding, and, you know, we're reaching out towards that, and hopefully we can achieve something of it. And, and the latter part of this book, many factors in it as well, written for the deeper understanding of those who have taken the third degree. In due time, our educational centers, particularly those concerned with adult education, and that's the kind of thing, you know, the Arcane School, the uh, Maury Federation University of Seven Rays, School of Esoteric Studies, and so forth, they're involved with the adult education, the continuing education, we might say. Um, and let's call it that, continuing education. Uh, a long and esoteric line that they will take into calculation normally and customarily. Uh, the fact of future initiation where their students are concerned. And notice he's careful about using the word future because so many people anticipate that they are candidates for initiation when they haven't really fulfilled uh, what has to be fulfilled. So um, in due time, our educational centers, particularly those concerned with adult education, will take into calculation, I guess there's a mathematics for it, normally and customarily, customarily, the fact of future initiation where their students are concerned, and will study their graduates from this angle in order to give advice or recommendation in these ins uh, in institutions. The elements of true esotericism will be taught, though they will not then be regarded as esoteric. So uh, this is uh, apparently later during the age of Aquarius, uh, when the new esoteric schools emerge. Uh, even now we're working on them, and uh, DK has given us justification for working on them. If you, if you study uh, uh, one of the latter chapters of Letters on Occult Meditation, we will see that basically he said even now we can, or then, you know, 1920 or so, work on the emergence of the new esoteric schools and promising uh, results are uh, occurring or were occurring even then. So the new adult uh, education will take into consideration 
uh, normally and customarily, uh, the initiatory potential of their students um, and their graduates, I suppose, will be uh, directed in a line which will lead to initiation. One day, these schools will actually present uh, candidates for initiation, especially, I suppose, the advanced schools. It will be apparent to you that this long treatise is in the nature of a preparatory thesis covering a vast area of information preparatory for what? Maybe, uh, well, let's see, you know, there, there's going to be more coming in the third installment. The first two volumes dealt with the sevenfold nature of man and with the influence of the seven basic energies or rays upon his unfoldment and his history, and in a briefer manner, upon the world in which he lives and upon the environment which aids and conditions him. So basically, you know, the seven rays through uh, esoteric psychology. In the third volume, we took into consideration the influences of the constellations and planets. Now, they are really inseparable from the study of esoteric psychology. They must be included. Uh, the influences of the constellations and planets upon the man and upon our planet, the Earth, and gave much time to consideration of esoteric astrology. Well, it, it's, uh, what did D.K. say, his most occult book, because it deals entirely uh, with energies. The rays, the signs, the constellations, and the planets are all of them closely interrelated, and the human being is the recipient of the energies and forces they emanate or distribute, and this makes a man what he essentially is at any one time whilst in incarnation. Um, the energies uh, and forces are changing constantly uh, through progressions. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Progressions and directions in the astrological chart. Uh, and also uh, in each fresh incarnation. So we are constantly being conditioned by different energies and forces, and even in the same incarnation, those energies and forces are changing all the time, and we want to know the manner in which they are changing so that we can use them. We next considered the subject of uh, esoteric, uh, subject of healing, because of the necessity of understanding the limitations. It's really a book on limitations, isn't it, and how to overcome them? Psychological and physical, which restrict man's free expression of divinity. So the vehicles uh, must be in good order. Uh, and as so often for so many of us, they are not really, none of us, uh, at least in the Tibetans, way of thinking has really perfect health. We dealt with a major condition which has to be faced and comprehended if humanity is ever to step off the ordinary path of evolution onto the path of discipleship and initiation. And humanity uh, as a whole is far from that, even though in a sense humanity will take the first initiation. This means a certain number of human beings who will leaven the entire mass, but it doesn't mean that all human beings will necessarily be treading the path of discipleship and initiation. Even into the next round, this will not be the case. Man has to become aware of the ray effects, of the place the centers play in his advance and unfoldment, and of the play of energies and forces which produce the difficulties and the diseases and can at the same time cure them and bring about the liberation of the man. So, you know, how to use the energies and forces uh, to offset limitations to which the human being is subject. And the, the methods of healing, they are all, uh, in this book, quite subtle methods. We're not talking about the ordinary medical and ameliorative uh, surgical methods. All, he does not uh, discount their value. We're talking about uh, the use of subtle energies directed uh, towards the soul, towards the different areas of the etheric body and so forth. And this will take some centuries, really, to develop. Okay. From the consideration of the limitations, we pass to an entirely new theme and an entirely 
new concept as regards man's education when he has reached a relatively very advanced stage of unfoldment. This is the rays and the initiations. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, this book is a book related to the new education. I gave you the new teaching and then the Antikarana. This is in the rays and initiations. Or the mode and method whereby the initiate could relate in one great fusion or at one moment, not only the soul and the personality, but monad soul and personality. So a very uh, integrative, uh, fusing teaching, very integrative, fusing teaching appears here in this book. This teaching has carried all that has hitherto been given down the ages another step further on and indicated the next stage of development of the disciples. So, you know, some people say the Tibetan is passé, you know, and immediately Alice Bailey died. Some other channels come forth with the uh, new and improved uh, uh, <laughs> teaching, uh, and yet, you know, we cannot fulfill what the Tibetan has given even the next 2,000 years um, when you look at uh, the content of some of these rules. So it, it's just uh, human um, uh, uh, eagerness and also ignorance and uh, also pride, uh, which causes one to discount the depth of this teaching given from the hierarchy as if it could possibly have some sort of uh, time limitation on it because, let's say, it was given before 1950. <laughs> it is ludicrous, of course. And now uh, will come the third installment of the Tibetan, uh, and it will... Uh, show that other efforts, uh, though I'm sure well-meaning, have uh, been subject to very human limitations, and such is not the case when teaching is given by the Master. The time has come, as hierarchy had foreseen, for further light upon the endless way. Well, I guess the way is endless in a particular uh, universe may be not endless because I, I think we have a finite uh, cyclic universe here, but uh, since the since there's an infinite succession of uh, manifestations of the great breath, uh, we can call it the endless way. Teachings uh, teaching and then the five initiations, which confronts all aspirants. Notice he uses that word. Um, I suppose, relating even to those who are aspirants for those higher degrees, has long been given has, and has become public property. It has meant very little to most people and nothing at all to the mass of men. So he's basically saying even students such as we are, who have been, uh, well, who study these matters, we have a lot more to learn. It has been regarded by the intelligentsia as vague and visionary nonsense uh, uh, subject, you know as they are to the limitations of the overly hmm, powerful concrete mind. Uh, some few have admitted that these initiations may be possible, and others say that they are simply symbolic modes of indicating some final achievement which mankind faces. Well, they're a lot more literal than that, aren't they? Still others have accepted this teaching and have come to regard the initiation as goals and have then taken the necessary steps to prove the veridical nature of their beliefs. Now, that's where we want to find ourselves, right? They have proved it, have become initiate, and have attained the status of master of the wisdom and taken their place within the hierarchy. So, this is our objective uh, uh, and our service will increase tremendously if we can do this. There is therefore a certain familiarity about these goals, the service they could entail, and the consummation of the hierarchical possibilities. This in itself indicates that the time had come when certain faint indications of that which lies behind the mysteries and of that which is to be seen ahead of those who have achieved initiation should be somewhat clarified and, uh, let's say, uh, does he mean the third? Because the others are, you know, probationary uh, initiations. Uh, they should be somewhat clarified. I have therefore started to impart 
Three phases of information. Okay. I gave out teaching which indicated the mode of bridging the gap between the three lower worlds and the world of the spiritual triad. Uh, now this is uh, the Antikoranic teaching. In doing this, it became apparent that there were three groups or levels of consciousness which had to be recognized. One, uh, the three worlds of human evolution. We are familiar, mental plane, astral plane, physical plane. Two, the three levels of the mental plane, the level of the concretizing mind upon which the mental unit is found, the level on which the soul is to be found, that's the egoic lotus largely, and the level of the abstract or higher mind. Uh, these are uh, three minds, and in one sense they must unite. Sometimes other three minds are discussed in three minds unite, but these three must unite, and then the three worlds of superhuman evolution, the levels of the spiritual triad, Atma Buddhi Manas, to which the uh, Antikarana makes application, uh, and uh, the nature of which, uh, the nature of this impersonal life we begin to feel and experience when we are somewhat succeeding in building the Antikarana. Between the higher three and the lower three and embracing the mental plane was a definite gap. Why is this? Well, we just hadn't come far enough yet. Maybe the failure on the moon chain. We had not come far enough in our evolution to bridge that gap. A break in the continuity of consciousness, conscious contact, or an area where there was no channeling for the inpouring of higher energies. Thus, the, you know, the, the need for the Antikarana as just such a channel, right? Uh, the need for the anti uh, as just such a channel. Here the teaching of the conscious building of the Antikarana was required. And thus the gap between the mental unit, see all this is quite technical occultism, between the mental unit and the monastic permanent atom, between the personality indwelt by the soul and the spiritual triad could be bridged by the aspirant uh, himself. You know, and when we look here, uh, ba -ba -ba, and this is the Fellowship of Cosmic Fire, and we're dealing with AAB diagrams, and we're looking at number eight, and this is exactly the gap which must be bridged. Uh, here we are given its uh, diagrammatic form, and um, also... Let's see. Okay, Fellowship of Cosmic Fire, and this is, uh, we'll look at these, which Tuya has created, my wife has created this, and here, um, rendering, uh, I think, a, a DK's uh, Egoic Lotus into the proper colors, here is a close-up of this gap, which has to be bridged, and, you know, this is uh, familiar to all of us, theoretically, and the experience of doing it is the very thing which we must learn to cultivate. Okay. Learn to recognize that experience. All right. So it could be bridged by the aspirant itself. Okay, so we're looking here at um, three phases of information. So one of them was learning about the Antikarana and its method of connecting the uh, personality, uh, the soul-infused personality, and the spiritual triad. The second, I found it necessary also to indicate the nature of the way of the high revolution, which had been uh, hinted at, but absolutely no information had been given. You know, and now we just take it as if it belongs to us. It's amazing. Uh, given first in initiation human and solar. And when I worked um, on the verbal part of the conclusion of a treatise on cosmic fire, I did focus very much on the way of higher uh, evolution, and I brought in all the three places where he has discussed it, namely, namely initiation, human and solar, a treatise on cosmic fire, and the rays and the initiation. So all of those were brought together, and I've given my impressions on that. But of course, one needs constantly to revisit it. It's not that we're going to be able to do those things uh, immediately or tread that kind of path, but 
kind of seeing where everything will lead is a great inspiration. Okay, uh, it is the way which opens out before the master of the wisdom of the fifth degree. It used to be taken at the fifth degree, but now the sixth, that way is now taken at the sixth, leading to states of identification and levels of awareness which lie outside the planetary sphere altogether. The following of this way enables the master to abstract himself from the seven planes of our planetary life and divest himself of all we understand of material existence, so we can call this leaving the cosmic physical plane. Forget not that our seven planes are only the seven subplanes of the cosmic physical plane and move on to the um, cosmic astral plane and even beyond. These are stages of vibration about which we can only um, theorize. You know, <laughs> Tibetan has given us so much that's so far ahead of us and yet it stabilizes our way uh, as we attempt actually to evolve in a way sanctioned by the uh, by the uh, spiritual hierarchy. And then number three, I have therefore opened up the subject of the possibility of the higher initiations, which confront the members of the hierarchy. And in this connection, it is useful to remember that, um, number one, uh, the council chamber at Shambhala provides a goal for members of the hierarchy, but not an abiding place, not... Uh, for uh, fifth-degree uh, initiates. Only some on the first ray may abide there, but not all. It's a goal. So we cannot talk glibly of uh, Shambhala, entering Shambhala at will and talking to Sanakumara at will. You know, uh, these are all products of ignorance and insufficient familiarity with the depths of the teaching. So they will be adjusted in time. Uh, so in this connection, it's useful to remember that the seven paths which stretch out before a master are entered by treading the way of higher evolution. Uh, it is the monad uh, who treads this way, not the personality or the soul, as we commonly consider the word soul. And number three, the so-called third initiation, the transfiguration is the only the first major initiation. It's the first solar initiation, really, and you'd simply become a disciple in relation to Sirius at that time from the standpoint of the hierarchy. It marks the moment in time and space when the initiate sees truly, uh, because there's so much of illusion that is lifted there, and for the first time, the door which opens onto this higher way. Uh, sees the possibility at the fifth degree to really uh, prepare for treading this higher way, making the decision at the sixth degree, but certainly studying the nature of the decision which might be made from the fifth degree onward. Then if he chooses the path that the Christ chose, and there is no reason that he should, you know, leaving us uh, very free, he will set his face to go up to Jerusalem and uh, this means Shambhala, uh, Jerusalem, uh, spiritual, uh, spirit, <laughs> sorry, to Jerusalem is Shambhala. But there are many uh, paths to be chosen, seven paths, seven ways to choose, and now nine. Later in the book he tells us that paths have been added here. Uh, and he, you know, the, the Christ um, chose the path of earth service. I mean, he is abidingly with us uh, ever since uh, 500 B.C., really, uh, when the Buddha uh, handed to him, in the way these things are done, who knows, the um, headship of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. And uh, usually the Bodhisattva's uh, term of service is 2,500 years, but the Christ chose a still longer duration, 5,000 years, which is very unusual. And uh, I, I think that kind of continuity was needed. You know, there is kind of an overlap between the sign uh, constellation Pisces and Aquarius, and maybe that presented the opportunity to bridge those two. So he is the, um, has been the world savior 
uh, for the Piscean Age, which is uh, shortly coming to an end, and he will continue to be world savior, world teacher, uh, the one who keeps the great wheel turning uh, all during the Aquarian Age. He And he will be, as we know, reinforced by the Avatar of Synthesis, uh, the Spirit of Peace, and the Buddha himself. So uh, what a tremendous support he will have for this monumental task of uh, leading uh, the cream of humanity into the fifth kingdom and elevating uh, all of humanity in that process and uh, bringing about, uh, inspiring the externalization of the hierarchy. Well, friends, you know, I, I did want to... Um, these are some things, some of the things that I've hinted at in past writings. Now he's going to be more explicit. They have been touched upon vaguely and mysteriously by past teachers and somewhat more explicitly by myself. And I suppose HPB touched upon some of these things, but she was under the directorship of Master DK, technically considered, but, you know, uh, working also with her master, Master M, and with Master KH, who is DK's master. So now he's going to be a little more definite in this new section. Well, I think, uh, friends, um, I wanted to get this started, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's something about plunging in here, and so this will be the end of Ray's, how shall I call it? Ray's and Initiations, uh, okay, Webinar Commentary. Ray's, Ray's and Initiations Webinar Commentary Program 1, and this will be um, one hour, and let's see where we are. In terms, we're on page uh, up to 327, and where did we begin? Might be nice to know that. We began at 321, so 321 to 327. That's where it is. Okay. Mm. 321 uh, to 327, and we'll be uh, beginning Raise and Initiation Webinar Commentary Program 2, uh, starting page 327. Right. Let us, um, let us do the Great Invocation there to start the ball rolling here, you know. <clears throat> oh. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. 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 Okay, friends. Just don't know how long this will take maybe uh, 
maybe a few years, I'm not sure. And meanwhile, I'll be doing other things, um, submitting other programs for you along the lines of meditation on meditations on identification and occasional specialized subjects and so forth. So we have begun then the rays and the initiations part two. And, you know, if you wish, go to Makara and read the commentary I've provided for you on the first part of the book. It'll take some doing. Uh, uh, one of my friends who has a class uh, going in California said they've just finished it now using all the commentaries. And uh, I guess it's taken a few years to do, but you can catch up and see what that may be all about. Some of you have already done it. So we'll see you shortly, and all the best to you. See you soon. Raise and Initiations, Part 2. Bye-bye.